Okay, so here we go. Life after Napoleon, and that's really going to be the putting back of Europe together. Now, I'm going to be completely honest, and I really appreciate these people for putting these notes online, so I kind of stole these notes, but the information is going to be there for you. Okay, so it's the Congress of Vienna, and Vienna is in Austria. Okay, again, Austria had been a major combatant of France during this time period and major nations around Europe uh, with monarchs in particular are going to get together at the Congress of Vienna and figure out what to do with Europe now that Napoleon is out of control or can, when I say out of control like he's not around anymore okay so here's what they come up with all right here's some questions you might want to think about asking yourself um, honors group answer these questions regular guys just think about these questions, okay? What was the meeting which uh, what was the meeting which attempted to restore Europe to what had been before the French Revolution? Napoleon, what's the significance of the Congress of Vienna? What is the belief that no one country should be more powerful than the others? What is the legacy of Napoleon? What is the legacy of the Congress of Vienna? You're going to answer all these, be able to answer these questions by the end of this video, okay? So here we go. First of all, you got to know who the big players are. Okay, the first one and the biggest one is this guy right here in the middle. I need you to put a star next to his name. He is the most important person that is there. That is Clemens von Metternich. He is known as the doctor of revolutions. He's the person who puts revolutions back to rest and not use them anymore. If you notice, you have a czar of Russia. You have a King Frederick, who is an enlightened uh, despot, but he's not, the picture's not there, but he is a king nonetheless. You have France's uh, Lord Talleyrand, and Talleyrand is not about being under control of people like Napoleon anymore, or Lord Castle Ra of Britain. But the big one right here is Clemens von Metternich. He's the guy you have to know, okay? Oh, there he is. There's King Frederick. He popped up a little late to the party. Okay, so here's what the Congress of Vienna is going to do. It's going to take the European monarchs, the idea of the European monarchs, going back to turning the clock before 1789, okay? So these people want to put the monarchs back in control, okay? And the big person behind it, like I mentioned, is going to be Prince Metternich of Austria. If you notice the other people that are there, we've mentioned the Duke of Wellington who stopped Napoleon. You have a kings and you have czars and princes. You have people who are there, uh, for the sole intention of putting Europe back together before the French Revolution. Okay, so here's the agenda. What are you going to do with France? Here's the big one. Make sure you underline this. The balance in power. How are we going to get the balance of power back in Europe? And how are we going to restore European monarchies? The big thing here is this, because we're going to move away from this revolutionary period more into a nationalistic period uh, where they're going to get together and say, you know, we don't need to fight anymore. We don't need these issues with Napoleon anymore. We don't need anybody like Napoleon anymore. We need to stop fighting. Of course, not going to work. Okay, not going to happen, but it's a real big attempt at moving Europe into this direction. Okay, so here's Metternich. All right, Metternich is a very conservative leader of the Congress of Vienna. He is extremely opposed to democracy and nationalism, which makes sense when you are a prince who might become a king. Okay, and he's definitely guided by this idea of legitimacy, this idea that birthright should bring you to control. Lawful monarchs, these birthright monarchs, should be in control and not. Napoleon. So when they do restore France, it's actually going to be King Louis the Seventeenth is going to come in. All right, the Bourbon dynasty is going to come back into control, and they want to go back to life before Napoleon. And that's what it says. I know it's a little cut off there, but life before Napoleon. So here are the general principles. Balance of power has got to be huge. Balance it out across Europe. Second thing, legitimacy. The legitimacy of rulers to make sure they are the rightful heirs to the throne and not someone like Napoleon compensation, getting money back for the lost uh, issues with the continental system under Napoleon. Liberalism, um, this idea that uh, you have a country based in its government and based in the liberal principles of its kings, okay, and not the, uh, or really the opposite of that, not the liberal nature of its kings, but this conservative nature of kings where they're in power and not the liberal issues or the, the revolutionary issues you're going to see through liberalism in Europe. Okay, and of course, conservatism, which is what the kings are going to be backed by, since it's going, trying to get back to this idea of absolute monarchies and having complete control over what's going on in Europe. Okay, and then of course, the rise of nationalism. Proud to be French, proud to be Austrian, in those cases that are going to build up over the next hundred years until we get to World War One, the conflicts that are really going to be uh, come to come to light because of that issue. 
All right, so when it's compensation, here's a couple ideas. Um, the ones you have to really write down are the first three here in a conversation. You've got to do all of them for compensation. Napoleon's enemies are rewarded with land. They're going to redraw the lines. Other nations are going to be compensated for land taken, and the map of uh, Europe is going to be redrawn. Really what you need to know about legitimacy is the idea, and you don't have to write all these guys down, but the idea that the uh, monarchs are going to be back in control. All these places that were affected by Napoleon are going to go back to control uh, of their own ideas. Here are the territorial changes. The big ones you have to kind of pay attention to, but you don't necessarily have to write them down, are Austria, uh, England, Austria is going to get modern parts of what is northern Italy. These are the Habsburgs taking control there. England is going to get the areas uh, like Malta in the Mediterranean. Ceylon, which is huge for tea, that's going to be Sri Lanka. Um, Cape Colony, which is down in South Africa. Uh, Guiana, which is in uh, South America. All right, so you're looking at England starting to begin to spread out. We talked about the British Empire. That's what's coming next is how strong the British Empire is. All right, Holland gains control of the Austrian Netherlands. That's Belgian. Uh, Prussia gaining parts of Poland, and that's going to be a later issue down the road when we get into the World War I. Russia gaining ports, uh, Finland and Poland, and, of course, Sweden gaining Norway. The big ones are the first two, though. Those are the ones you really have to know. Okay, so here's a map of Europe after the Congress of Vienna. All right, you can see the German Federation. Uh, 30 states of Germany are now located between these lines. Uh, you can see the expanse of Russia, the Austrian Empire that's getting bigger under the Habsburgs. Where France, and this is going to be a point of contention right here down the road. Um, and of course, what they do with the Piedmont or Sardinia, the idea of Austria being in control of these areas as well. All right, so here's the fate of national. People had no say over territorial changes. Of course, when you start mixing these territories, you're going to start mixing cultures and mixing groups of people who don't get along, okay? And this is going to be an issue which the governments and the monarchs and the control of Europe is not going to pay attention to, not just here with Europe, but also with the issues um, in the Berlin Conference of Africa and then also the issues leading up to World War I. So kind of the Congress of Vienna is a precursor to World War I. Language, nationality, and religion weren't even taken into consideration, okay? Um, they're not going to pay attention to who is where, and that's going to cause a major, major problem down the road. Okay, uh, Louis the Seventeenth of France. Okay, no more divine right of kings. Uh, there's a constitutional monarchy we can put into place. Of course, they're going to go through an entire another entire uh, French Revolution again, a much smaller one. But Louis is going to, the Seventeenth is going to be in control. In this case, this is Louis the Eighteenth of France uh, that's going to have control. And you can see he's much different than his uh, founding family that had been in control before. You're going to have buffer states uh, to basically surround France to make sure they can't do this again. All right. And then you're going to have, and the big one you have to know is this first one here, the Concert of Europe. That's the one you got to write down um, as a big result. Okay. The group of leading nations which periodically met to discuss issues regarding stability. They wanted to continue to keep their control um, over Europe. So they met to make sure that happened. All right. So the Congress of Europe gets it going. The Concert of Europe makes sure it brings them back together. Um, go ahead and write down this idea of the principle of intervention. The great powers of Europe had the right to send armies into countries where there were revolutions in order to restore legitimate monarchs. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the Declaration of Pillen. It's trying to make sure the French monarchy got back to control. Now, if you notice, Great Britain did not agree with this policy because they weren't on the mainland. So they had an issue there. Plus, they're expanding their reaches farther out past just Europe. And then lastly, go ahead and write down the issues that are going to come down the road. Um, there's going to be little conflicts here and there, the Crimean War, the Austro-Prussian War, the Franco-Prussian War, but the big one's not going to happen until World War I. All right, so here's a legacy, and this is what you really need to know, the balance of power doctrine, that it's going to keep legitimate monarchs, the restoration of monarchies in power, and make sure that France does not spread out, these other kingdoms do not spread out, and they kind of keep themselves in check. You're also going to get a new political map of Europe, is the one you see here to your right, and then very new political philosophies that are going to contradict and help the monarchies as well, kind of stemming from the ideas of enlightenment, but moving on into what's going to become greater conflict. Okay? And here's some maps here at the end that you can flip through on your own if you want to. All right, so understand what we're trying to get at here with the concert or the Congress of Vienna, how important that was at the time to really kind of fix Europe away from Napoleon, but it's not going to fix it for the better. It's going to cause even more problems. If you notice, or you'll see with Europe here in the long run, more and more problems are going to happen on really bad decisions.